The wine bottle team, 21st century. So this is an idea I did in my book of basketball about trying to figure out not just an all-time team, but vintages of the players, almost like in wine. Like when, when you're at a restaurant, you order like the 2002 or the 1998. It always struck me we should do this for basketball and specifically with the NBA. So that's the purpose of this. We're going 21st century. We're picking players and their vintages and figuring out what the right team is. So the other thing with this is I want the team to make sense. I want the team to be able to resemble a real team. The theory is like Bob Ryan used to have this old gimmick about if the aliens came and landed on Earth and we had to scramble and assemble a team right on the fly, what is that team? It's not an all-star team. We actually want a team that can win. So in this case, like I want a team that makes sense. And in 2018, I want shooting. I want flexibility. I want defense. I want to be able to bring young legs off the bench. So I picked a team, but I did ask some people in the Ringer universe to comment on my picks and my vintages and my wine bottle team. So you're gonna hear from them as well. Here's our team. Two thousand thirteen LeBron James, can we see that? Mr. Simmons, as you requested, the twenty thirteen LeBron James are oh. highest PR in the collection. It's low on neckbeard, right? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. First one, obviously, LeBron James, queen of the chessboard. He can be a power forward, he can be a small forward, he can be a point guard, he can run the team, he can post up, he can do all these things. The best LeBron year, in my opinion, was 2013, 27-game winning streak. Yeah, I mean, LeBron was just, like, unbelievable that year. Like, really, the, the, the embodiment of, like, a modern player with forward size and guard speed, but also shooting threes. I, I, I like this. I'm not the biggest fan of LeBron James as a basketball player. I more like him as, you know, the savior of our current galaxy. Uh, but 2013 LeBron, I cannot go wrong with that. Fantastic player. This is the best vintage of LeBron uh, because it's got the best pairings. We usually think about LeBron in terms of individual heroism or individual villainy. You know, it's like he's there to save Cleveland, then he betrays them by going to Miami, then he saves them by going back to Cleveland. But this was the year that he transcended all that and became a part of something that was just bigger than even him. Wait, Bill did this list? So we, we're not gonna do Kedrick's three minutes in 2002? 2013 LeBron was the pregame dunk show LeBron. That was like a whole other spectacle. People turn out for the Steph Curry warmups, but before that there was LeBron dunking. And you wanna know what's a better show? LeBron dunking. As I think about his dunking more than I think about the 27 game win streak, which was an amazing winning streak in the middle of a season. We really hated LeBron James then. That was great because he went to Miami, it was fantastic. He was just like truly a beast. Everything about him physically, had really blossomed into the kind of Carl uh, Malone slash whatever the hell he is superhero that that I think uh, he became. And if you recall, in the middle of that time, they did their iconic Harlem Shake video. 2013 LeBron was having a lot of fun. He was on the right team. He had figured out that balance, how to go inside, how to stay outside, how to run a team, when to take over, and is just one of the greatest athletes we've ever had and one of the most overpowering. You know what I love most about those Heat years? That became, I guess, LeBron's team, because remember how stupid that was? That Dwayne Wade kept reminding us all the time that he had to give the team up. I don't know exactly what the timeline was. I know LeBron in that, like, I think Wade did 400 interviews that year, where he's like, you know, and credit to me, I let this be LeBron's team. Well, guess what you were doing without him? Losing in the first round every year. He won the title this year. He won the MVP. Also would put up 28, eight and eight and people would, and it's boring almost. Like he'd shoot 40% from three, go 28, eight and eight. You'd look up, he'd add 26 points like in the third quarter and just be like, oh man, this is like totally boring. But there was a part early in the fourth quarter of game six when the Spurs were, I think they were up by like five points and Mario Chalmers shot it. And it missed everything, it missed the rim completely, which is what Mario Chalmers does. LeBron caught it and dunked it, but all in, this, like all in the same motion he did that. And while he was doing that, Tim Duncan reached up to try to stop it and he knocked the headband off of LeBron. And then LeBron went nuts after that. He didn't put it back on for the rest of the game. It just went insane. But that was the one year I remember watching LeBron and being like, all right, this is probably the greatest player of all time. And it was the team that seemed to find the most harmony around LeBron. It seemed to be the team that was engineered best around his specific, pretty much unprecedented skill set. This was if you're drinking LeBron James, you would pick the 2013. You might take a crack at the 09, it's a little young, 
The 13 is the vintage you want. The 18, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what kind of chemicals are in the 18. The 2017 KD, can we see that? 2017 Kevin Durant, uh, full of oaky afterbirths. Great, great legs on this one, right? Nice long legs. Great, thank you very much. The second player who has to be in it is Kevin Durant. The question is what Kevin Durant? He won the MVP in 2014. I'm not sure that's the right Kevin Durant. I like 2017 playoffs. Kevin Durant is my favorite. Oh, uh, 2017 KD. This is uh, championship era KD, right? KD, like, ugh. <laughs> like, yes, he's the second best player in the NBA. Maybe he'll be first this season, but he's just so unfun. He's like the like the wine that you have to try, like when you're getting a flight and you're into tasting. Like you're like, oh yeah, I guess I know I know I should try this, but I'm not gonna like it. That's Kevin Durant. He's fine. I love this KD. I'll tell you why, man. Because when KD signed with the Warriors, everybody else uh, thought it was the weakest move in the whole world. And I was like, get yours, KD. The whole time Durant's on the Thunder, everybody's wondering what would it look like if he was just playing in this more elegant offense that moved the ball and used the best of his abilities to the highest possible potential. We found out. To me, is the least interesting player on here. Like, it makes the most sense that he would be there because he was just this basketball cyborg doing basketball-y things better than everybody else. But it just wasn't any fun. It was a big seven-foot glass of water is what he was. 2017 Kevin Durant with the Warriors is great for a bunch of reasons. One, he was awesome. The guy went for 38, 31, 33, 35, and 39 in the NBA Finals uh, to close out the Cavs. He had almost that identical three-point shot at Game 3 that he also had in the 2018 Finals at Cleveland, so it was very similar. But meanwhile, instead of watching Durant go for 30-plus in every single game of the NBA Finals, everybody sat there and bitched about how good the Warriors were. So it actually became this thing, instead of just watching it and enjoying it, you hate-watched it because everybody was mad about how good this roster was. How long can you come up second, couldn't get it done? I wondered how he would mesh with the rest of the Warriors and they found a seamless way to play the same type of basketball that the Warriors had already been playing and KD was sort of the offensive catalyst to this. If you were like KD, you're on the, the wine bottle team, he would just take so much issue with that. I think he'd be like, no, I'm, I'm a fine whiskey by myself. Don't include any of this in the video, it's mean. He was crazy in the playoffs, crazy. And it was the first time that I actually looked at LeBron James and went, yo, he can't hold this guy. Percentage-wise, this was statistically the best run he had in his career. And if you remember, in Game 3 in Cleveland, up 2 nothing, he took over that game against the best player in the world and really went toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. I thought he was the best player in that series. The thing I like about putting KD on a wine bottle team, uh, potentially he could even play the center if he wanted to go super small ball, but he could play three spots, fits into whatever, doesn't need the ball all the time. He's just the perfect guy for a team like this. Really showed a level of sensitivity that was uncommon, I think, among great players. And a, and a facility with social media that was truly remarkable. Really brought into, into stark focus questions of identity. What does it mean to be a person? His story is not yet completely written as a basketball player. I want to see what Kevin Durant does when he leaves Golden State. And Golden State fans, he's going to leave Golden State. so or buckle your chin straps, that's gonna happen. But that version of playoffs KD is one of the best basketball players I've ever seen. In a game, if the aliens come, I know I can. I know he can get us two points. I know I can run, pick and roll with him. He just knows what he's doing, doesn't care, doesn't overpower his teammates like um, <coughs> Kobe. He just fits in, and that's what I want with my wine bottle team. The uh, 03 Duncan. Yes, Mr. Simmons, our 2003 Tim Duncan, our most consistent bottle. Reliable. Very much aged to perfection. Nice, good, good, nice, strong, safe wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, goes with any meat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim Duncan, the most underappreciated Pantheon guy that we have. 2003, wins a title by himself. He had a very young Tony Parker and a very young Manu Ginobili and Steven Jackson. And it's just like, you look at the team and you're like, how did that team win a title? It's like, because Tim Duncan was on it. 2003, Tim Duncan's my favorite basketball player of all time. Right underneath him is 2014, Tim Duncan. And then underneath him is every other Tim Duncan that has played. 03, Tim Duncan, boring as per usual. I mean, that was a good victory, sure. Congrats, Spurs fans, let's move on. Man, 2003, Tim Duncan was so f***ing annoying. Because it's like, bank shot, bank shot, here we're gonna another bank shot. Give it, give it to Duncan. Nobody can stop the bank shot. 
I, I'm pretty sure that Tim Duncan's numbers from that year were sensational, but I can't remember one thing that Tim Duncan did that entire year because nothing he has done has ever been captivating or compelling. There was a part during the fourth quarter, Tim Duncan's going crazy, and the, the Lakers did the thing where they put Shaq on him, which was a, you know, a common tactic that they had tried. And usually it worked out pretty well, but Tim Duncan just eviscerated him too. 2003, Tim Duncan is the only player who deserves to be on the wine model list. He almost single-handedly killed my love of basketball. We think about the Spurs now as this international house of aesthetically pleasing basketball. They were Terminators back then, and they were squeezing the life out of the game because they were just too good. They were too good. They were military in their precision. They were unflappable. They were dirty, and Duncan was the perfect avatar of all of it. You go back and watch him now, it's unbelievable the physical contact that he's absorbing in these series against New, New Jersey, or whoever else was, they were playing against. And it was just routine that you'd see him put up 20 and 20s and barely break a sweat, much less a smile. He was 25 and 15 in the playoffs. In the deciding game against the Nets, 21 and 20, 10 assists, eight blocks. 21, 20, 10 and eight, almost had a quadruple double. Uh, doesn't need the ball necessarily, but if, if you have to get it to him, he can post up on anybody. Great athlete back then. Think about this, in that six game series against the Nets, he played 44 minutes or more or five of those six games. And the crazy thing is, is we didn't ask if he was tired for five hours on Sports Center the next day, just because an NBA player played 44 minutes. <laughs> I just get so mad about the rest shit in the playoffs. Like everybody's good until they're not good and then it's only because they're tired. Like Harden against the Spurs two years ago, the guy gets like 50, and then it's like he sucks in a pressure spot, which we've seen a million times before. We'll be like, ah, oh, just ran out of gas. It was like the antithesis of what you wanted basketball to be, which was like these incredible athletes operating on the edge of like your perception of what the human body could do. And then it's like Tim Duncan just like with perfect footwork. It's like, who, what is this? This sucks. He was like really one of the first guys we were like, oh man, long arms, that's good. He can't jump, but like if your arms are long, like you can do a lot of stuff. Because it's been 15 years ago, we're kind of, we remember older Tim Duncan from the 2013 finals. He's playing on one leg, not nearly as athletic. Uh, young Tim Duncan was the best power forward of all time and could also play center against the right lineups. If anything, in 2018, he's even more devastating because he'd basically be the ultimate five you could ever have now. Somebody that could defend anyone on one side and then post up anyone on the other side. Very aggressively the worst worst dresser in modern NBA history. Just incredible. Wore Jinko jeans, I think, at one point. Is that not true? Maybe, I might be making that up. But he wore like jeans that were like for five people. I just think he's the best big man of the of this century. Uh, Duncan had no holes whatsoever, and in my opinion, is one of the seven best parts of all time. And one of the four most boring. Yeah, this is beautiful. I've never had wine. Ever? Ever. I've never had a glass. I've smelled it, my wife drinks it. I've never had a beer or like a shot of whiskey or whatever, but I would drink this. Whatever is in, whatever is in this bottle, I would drink. I would drink all of it. It could be fucking acid. It could be bleachy acid that you set on fire and I would drink this. That's beautiful. Uh, can I see the 16 curry? In 2016, uh, it, says 20, uh, it says 2006 on this. No, I ordered the 16. <laughs> the 2016 Steph Curry, the uh, only one in our collection to have the 50, 40, 90 numbers. A groundbreaking yes. kind of wine, new vintage. Mm -hmm. Really took some chances with this. The fourth no-brainer pick on the wine bottle team. This one surprised me. Steph Curry from 2016, 30 points a game. He made five threes a game. The best shooter I've ever seen in my life. Just like truly an unfair shooter. Um, I'll never forget the Knicks almost selecting him. Oh, Steph is great. That was the, the, like the most magical version of Steph Curry. So 2015-16, Steph Curry, this is obviously the 73 win Golden State Warriors team. My favorite thing about Steph and this team, it's basically like at a certain point, once they got rolling, this was like the Beatles coming to town. Every night was an event and every night they would go into somebody's gym. They wanted to get 
a mark against them. They wanted to beat the Warriors. But Steph was incredible on the road this season. He would go into Toronto, into New Orleans, into Washington, into Minnesota, drop 40 in somebody else's gym, tear it down. There's also like Steph Curry um, in opposing gyms, like the gym makes a sound like, like if a baby gets away from its parents and is like running towards an intersection. The crowd makes that like oh, 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 sound like just a, they're about to see something truly horrible and you just know that he can hit that too. Terrible feeling. 2016 Steph was feeling himself. I think that the most surprised person that they lost after being at 3-1 three, three was 2016 Steph. He just was a little bit too big for his britches and uh, he choked. That's the only way to put it. I guess he also was hurt, so there's that. Just having him out there makes everyone else more dangerous because if he's out there, everybody else is worried about what he's doing. And if you put him on a team like this where you also have LeBron James and Kevin Durant and Tim Duncan and Curry's over here who has to be dealt with all the time for every possible reason, um, that just makes everyone else better. 2016 sucks for Steph for a bunch of reasons, but now it's because there are two camps. When Steph isn't playing well in the playoffs, he's hurt. And when he's playing well, I guess he isn't hurt. And look, I thought he was hurt in 16, but I think he had 37 in one of the finals games. And you go, okay, so you can't drive as much. And then the Kevin Love switch and contested three is, is somehow on Steph's tombstone and three titles don't mean anything. And yes, I stick up for Steph all the time. Um, but that was a really weird run for him, and them blowing that 3-1 lead, you know, is, is something people still make jokes about. I guess the Yankees in 04 should just be psyched we didn't have Twitter. And he goes nuts on everybody. He hits all the threes. He hits the 35-foot game winner. That was an unbelievable version of Steph Curry. Short of any Spurs players or not including any Spurs players, he's my, that's my favorite year of favorite player that's ever been in the NBA, I think. I, I mean, probably the greatest shooter in NBA history. Like, just because catch and shoot, pull-ups, the range is truly absurd. Like, totally unfair. Really recreated what we thought, um, what we thought a jump shooter could do in terms of his effect on the overall team. My favorite basketball player other, ever, besides another guy we're gonna talk about. This is the year that they lost. All right, I gotta change my opinion on this year. This Steph Curry was kind of disappointing, man. The Steph Curry the year before could do anything. He could go to the rim, go high up off the glass. He was efficient, he was all these things. I'm sure the numbers are good, but this was one of the first years that people started to wonder if Steph had what it took like in the playoffs. I would say that that version of Steph Curry to me is a second teamer. A lot of people think that Kevin Durant decided to go to the Warriors after the 2016 Western Conference Finals, but I actually think it happened in February. That's when the Warriors went into Oklahoma City. They were 52 and five. That's not real. How does that happen? Steph goes in, they double team him. They triple team him. They throw Steven Adams at him. They throw Russ at him. They throw Andre Roberson at him. They throw Durant at him. He scores from 35 feet. He scores at the rim. He was not only unguardable, at his prime like that, he's unbeatable. It's not even surprising that Kevin Durant decided to go play with him. Who else was he gonna play with? Also, Steph was the guy who really, he really popularized like shooting and then turning around before like the shot even went through, which is like really disrespectful in a, in a, in a fundamental way. If I look at these first four guys, LeBron, KD, Tim Duncan, Steph Curry, my chemistry is amazing. My chemistry is so good that I can take a risk with the fifth guy. Um, fuck it, let's roll the dice. Can I see the 06 Kobe? Mr. Simmons, this is our 2006 Kobe Bryant. Not much to say about this. You pretty much know about what you're getting with this flavor. It's an overpowering wine. Very, very strong. Yes. Very popular in the LA area. Also does not go well with any foods. I can pull in one enigmatic, maybe, asshole. Um, I can put that in. I can bring in the guy who might be a little bit selfish, who might be a little bit narcissistic, who might be in it for his own reasons, who might be giving lectures about what a great leader he is, and meanwhile everybody's like, we all fucking hate you, what are you talking about? I can afford to have that guy on this team because everybody else is so awesome and everybody else's chemistry is so great. So 2006 Kobe.
<laughs> Kobe. What a terrible pick. That was Bill's pick. What a terrible pick. I, I don't believe that Bill really wants Kobe on this list. This is like, I feel like this should be like a few good men and we should question him. Let me tell you something about Bill Simmons. I know you guys like him. Like he's your guru and he's your leader. This is all his, you know, this is his shop. The Kobe thing has to stop, okay? I'm, I'm sick of it, man. When you open up the encyclopedia and you look up hero ball, it's a picture of this Kobe Bryant season. 81 point game against Toronto, RIP Jalen Rose. He has a month long stretch, a month long stretch where he averages 43 points a game in basketball, in the NBA. And they were still like kind of hand checking back then. That's wild. It's not up for debate. Kobe Bryant is an all timer. He's a top 25 best player. He's a top three shooting guard. I, he's a top five guard period. Maybe top three guard period. I, I don't know why we're debating this. 2006 Kobe Bryant is the best offensive basketball player of all time. He's the greatest, unguardable. Where couldn't Kobe score from? Kobe gets it in the post, he's scoring. Kobe's shooting the three, he's scoring. Kobe's doing whatever he wants to do. There was a, a listen, I'm gonna say something right now. Skill for basketball skill at his peak. Kobe Bryant is the best offensive player ever, better than Michael Jordan. Kobe was unstoppable. The funny thing about it is that Kobe probably definitely thinks he's the best player on this list. So I don't know how that would go in the locker room or in the wine cellar as it were. I think it, another chemistry problem, to be honest with you, it'd be tough. At least with Duncan and Curry, you've got two guys who kind of like won't say anything. Like Curry will get pissed, but he'll get pissed in the off season. He won't get pissed during the season. Tim Duncan will never say anything. Uh, Kevin Durant will mostly vent on social media as another person. 35 a game. That is a crazy, crazy number because you have an 82 game season. I don't know if you know that but you've got to score 35 for six straight months, basically. And if you have 27 one game, you've got to pick that up and have 42 the next game. The thing I remember most about that year was he, uh, he just gave up. So let me get this right. Simmons picks 06 Kobe when everybody says he quit against the Suns as his vintage Kobe bottle. I can't believe he lives out here in LA and he feels safe with that kind of stuff. There's an entire generation of players who like only acknowledge Kobe as like as the king, as the basketball prince who was promised. I, I don't know what we're debating. I don't know how you, how does he make it on the list? Like of all of the Kobe Bryants, if you're gonna put Kobe on there, which you should not, but if you're going to, don't pick the, don't pick that version, the version who gave up. I don't want him. That's the opposite of what we know Kobe for. Why him? My fear, is you put a wine bottle team like this that makes no sense, that lives in a fairy tale alternate universe, but let's pretend it's real. You put him on this team, you don't want Kobe to be the one to say, I got this guys, or clear out, or we're down two to the aliens all of a sudden with a minute left, and Kobe's like, get out of my way, I got this, I got this, because I don't want him to get this. I have Kevin Durant on this team. I have LeBron James, who's the second best player of all time. I have Tim Duncan who I can get two points from anytime I want and I have Steph Curry to stretch the floor. So the case could be made for this fifth spot. Am I just better off with like Clay Thompson? And he's just like, maybe he even smoked a bowl at halftime. He's just chill out, he's good. Am I better off with somebody like that on this team because I have so many other weapons? Or Kobe Bryant who might single-handedly throw this out of whack if he doesn't like the fact that he's only t took two shots in the first half, or everybody's talking about how great LeBron is. It's a conundrum, but ultimately I'm afraid of the Laker fans and they know where I live. It's like the octagon. I think there's gonna be, you'd have to let him wrestle for it. Like you'd have to settle it in practice. Be like, okay, if we get into a close game final minutes, somebody's gotta get the ball. Now, in order to figure that out, and then you do like the Joker thing where you take the pool cue and break it and you just throw it on the ground and be like, I'm gonna come back in five minutes and the person who's alive gets to take the shot. If you're begrudgingly uh, putting Kobe Bryant 2006 on any list, you can pretty much begrudgingly kiss my ass. <laughs> you know, you like, like seriously, all jokes aside, man. Love you, Bill, but come on, dog. I also really, the real reason is if we lost to the aliens or if this fell apart for whatever reason, we needed a lightning rod, and I think he's perfect. He did get swept like seven times during the course of his career. 
I'm just saying when it goes bad, it goes really bad with Kobe. If it goes bad in this case, the aliens take over the planet, so that would be bad. So the wine bottle bench, there was one guy that had to be on this bench, and then the rest of it was a lot harder to figure out, but I knew I needed this guy. 2017 Kawhi Leonard. Who? Oh, this is before he lost his desire to play. Where's the, where's the waiter in this place? Is he just not, he's just gone? Almost won the MVP, arguably could have. Uh, the best defensive player probably of this decade on the perimeter. Well, somebody has to play defense on this team. I would say he is the second best perimeter defender I've ever seen in my life behind Scottie Pippen. I can't think of any player that ascended in such a slow way and yet all of the hype is completely legitimate of how special a player he is. I love Kawhi Leonard. I, I gotta be honest with you, you can make a very good case that 2017 Kawhi Leonard was the best overall basketball player in the entire league. If I need to shut somebody down, he was literally put on the earth to do it. He's all muscle and is might be an alien, it's possible. It's a little hard to like remember that in the moment because of all of the drama and the laughter that has happened in the last uh, year and then the last few weeks. And by laughter, I mean his maniacal laugh that is incredibly disturbing. <laughs> My favorite thing about his laugh is that none of it, none of the sounds match his mouth. <laughs> it's like a dubbed martial arts movie. But 2017 Kawhi carried his team to the Western Conference Finals that was pretty impressive. And the only way to stop him was by injuring him. Zaza Pachulia, we see you. All the percentages are good. And doesn't speak, which is perfect, because I don't need a lot of people to speak. I have a lot of characters on this team. Uh, every once in a while, he'll do that laugh. LeBron will make fun of him. It'll be great. We need Kawhi Leonard on this team. The next no-brainer, by all accounts, Kevin Garnett, one of the greatest teammates of all time, by all accounts. Ability to play the five, the four, to guard all kinds of people. Unbelievable athlete. He was okay if other people took over at the end of games, and he took a lot of shit. You need someone on this team that's gonna grab another person by the face and scream directly into their soul. No, thank you. Now, this was a great version of Kevin Garnett. The best version, probably. Maybe 2008 was a more enjoyable version for me, but 2004, again, all of this is a, revolving around Tim Duncan. 2004, we were still very much having the Tim Duncan debate, which to me was ridiculous. Like really, truly crazy. One of the great um, what ifs is like, what if tr switch Duncan for Garnett and what happens to their careers? I, I, I mean, I think we're, we're talking about KG is like better, so much better than Duncan that it's actually not even funny. If KG played for pop, I think we'd be like, wow, Tim Duncan's okay, but like Kevin Garnett is like a god. Garnett is a magical defensive player, a very good offensive player, especially this year on Minnesota. He was wondrous on offense. He's the type of dude who jumps up on the scorer's table and hypes up the crowd, and he is the type of dude who will definitely find your deepest, darkest insecurities and exploit them to get an edge, and you need somebody like that on your team. This 04 year that we picked, was the one year there was like a real crunch time KG. He went head-to-head head head with Chris Webber. He beat him. He basically carried a Minnesota team, and by the time they got to the finals, they just had nothing left in the tank. The Lakers made it. Lakers ended up losing to the Pistons. This was the best Kevin Garnett year. He was amazing. Also, like, he played in an era when it was like, it was not cool to be the guy who passed and played a team game. It was like Kobe really, we were still like high on Jordan fumes at that time, so like everyone, Kobe made sense at that time. It's like, this is what a superstar does. Takes all the shots. Takes bad shots at the end of the game. Whereas KG would be like, I'm gonna set screens. I'm gonna block shots. I'm gonna rebound and do all the other things. If someone has a better shot, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it. But also I'm gonna get 20 points and 20 rebounds a game and five assists and three blocks. Um, but it was just not cool to be that guy at the time. Really underrated. Kevin Garnett is like unbelievably underrated to this day you know, if not for Duncan, would have been remembered as the best power forward, not only of the century, but maybe ever. So he has to be on this team. And I think out of everybody we picked out of these 12 guys, I think KG would enjoy it the most. And just being a lather in the locker room before the games and just sweating already and like Steph Curry kind of side-eyeing him with Durant, like wondering what's going on with KG. You need somebody like that. You need the crazy guy. And I think he'd be the crazy guy. 2018 Anthony Davis. So now, now we're golden because we have 03 Duncan, 
we have 04 KG, and now I have 18 Anthony Davis, who was probably the most explosive power forward we had this, this century. The only guy that we have who played that position who could put up 45 points on a Friday night. You're not even surprised. Anthony Davis, as he starts to come into his own in this league, the rest of the league is going to be in trouble. What do you say about Anthony Davis? Like, I feel like he should have been better. He was great in 2018. He was doing incredible things. But I feel like we're to the point now where he should be dunking from the three-point line already. And he's not, and it makes me sad. 2018 Anthony Davis, the boy who broke basketballreference.com. Many a night I sat there looking at Twitter as people would tweet out things like, only Wilt Chamberlain and God have done this before on a Wednesday night in the NBA. Anthony Davis routinely shattered what we thought was possible from a guy of his size in terms of his dexterity, in terms of his shooting ability, in terms of his playmaking even. He's basically the ultimate offensive weapon in basketball right now. He's just got to find a team to be on. Uh, Anthony Davis, 2018. Here's the thing, can he be like healthy for a whole season first? I, mean, I, I understand that he's really, really good, but like his legs are made of, of pretzels. Davis went 47-10 and 10 in one of those games against Portland. Remember, Portland was a three seed. They'd figured out their defensive problems from really the first half of the season and even that previous year and they get swept, and all we've heard from Portland at this point is diss tracks and tweets. And the great thing about that series against Portland, and he still killed it against Golden State, is that it actually had us in the NBA community asking the question, is Davis the most talented player in the league? And the best part is, he still hasn't gotten so pissed off to force a trade, which is probably six months away. 2018 Anthony Davis is truly a fine wine. He has hit his vintage. Is that how you say it? I don't know anything about wine. 2018 Anthony Davis was ready to be uncorked and that's what happened when the DeMarcus Cousins came went down. He was so happy to have the team back to himself. He just went crazy. At the end of the season when they were fighting for playoff positioning, he was so fired up and he just dragged his team to the playoffs. That's true of the best Anthony Davis performances. He just like finds some gear that he often doesn't access and just makes it happen. The ability for him to run a pick and roll with um, either Steph Curry or LeBron or Chris Paul, whoever. I, I think he's somebody that could maybe even be a crunch time guy for this team against the right lineups. And just flexibility in somebody that just loves what he does. Good athlete, catching him in the basically the athletic prime of his career, no brainer. He's a very, he's a very fluid player even for a guy that big and that long. <laughs> I know you guys are gonna catch that, so that's why I said it. <clears throat> There's gonna be a bunch of people in the comments down low that go, hey, Van said that Anthony Davis was big and long. Whatever, I just gave it to you. Do it yourselves, you're immature. All right, so I have four spots left. I needed a backup two guard, especially for if this Kobe thing doesn't work out and we have to send him home. I don't know what happens with those six Kobe. He's a wild card, he was my one wild card pick. If it doesn't work out, I got Ray Allen. I have 2001 Ray Allen from the Bucks, who in the playoffs, 25, four and six, almost a 50, 50, 90 guy percentage wise, three threes a game, and was just ahead of his time. I think if you took 2001 Ray Allen, you put him in a time machine and moved him to 2018 and you told him before the season, you can shoot 12 threes a game. He'd be like, really great. And he would, he would have been like putting up numbers like what Curry and Clay put up. Back then, you weren't supposed to jack up threes like that. I don't want to talk about Ray Allen because of 2013 Ray Allen. He could shoot. 2001 Ray Allen, I mean, okay, sure. No one cared about Milwaukee in 2001. Not sure they do right now. He was a way better offensive player than I think he gets credit for. I think people remember the last part of his career and he's more of a specialist. Oh, f Ray Allen from this season. Hold on, this is the, that Buck season? Ray Allen doesn't belong on this team. Let me tell you why. This is the season, uh, the Iverson season. So first of all, I'm personally holding this against Bill for the rest of my life, that this Iverson season didn't make the vintage team. Ray Allen is part of a team that tried to break Allen Iverson's plexus. Solar plexus, is that what it is? I always thought he was incredible in that, in that Bucks season, and, that, and they should have made the finals. The league robbed them. David Stern, there were a lot of crimes on his behalf over the years. It's a lot of things he's going to have to answer for when he gets to the uh, basketball pearly gates. The 01 Bucks is like kind of the lost, buried under the rug thing. They, they got just robbed.
it, it, they just wanted Iverson in the finals. The entire series was officiated that way. And, uh, and it, we got robbed from seeing that Bucks team in the finals, and specifically Ray. You know, you're looking at this position, you have 2009 Dwayne Wade, who was unbelievable. I have 2003 T-Mac, who was phenomenal. Uh, any Allen Iverson year. But I don't need somebody who's scoring 30 points a game or somebody who jacks up a lot of shots. I need somebody to blend in with what I have. And Ray Allen is one of those guys that he just knows how to play basketball. He blends in, he can hit open shots, he can do whatever, and uh, he's one hell of an actor. Backup point guard, I agonized over this one. It came down to Chris Paul and Steve Nash. Steve Nash, who won two straight MVPs, who is one of statistically the best and most efficient offensive players, not just in the guard position, but ever, versus Chris Paul, who um, is almost as efficient as Nash. I don't think he was as brilliant of an offensive player, but he was like 90% there. I don't think he's as fun to play with as Nash was, but he's a better defensive player. I would rather have Chris Paul than Steve Nash. Uh, even the losers get lucky sometimes. Look, I feel like he's probably the best player in the league to not win a title uh, right now. He's probably the best point guard I've ever seen in my like basketball going life. Everybody just hated 2014 Chris Paul, but he was good. Chris Paul was like, he was like a dentist, like a really good dentist, where you hate going there, but you understand that this person is really good at their job. And it's kind of a tragedy that, that every time he gets close to the cup, something goes wrong, usually with his hamstrings. Uh, this was a great season for him. This is a great season for the Clippers, but at the end of the day, he didn't have it. Uh, so we just won't be putting him in crucial game situations, but he'll be a great game manager otherwise. This was peak choking Chris Paul. So they, they just eked out a win against the Warriors, who were still coached by Mark Jackson, and I believe uh, had a lot of a lot of uh, pettiness on the court, which I loved. A real precursor to the, to the modern era of the Warriors. And then they go to face the Oklahoma City Thunder in round two. The Thunder should have lost the series. They won one game because of Reggie Jackson, and if that's what's happening to your team, Chris Paul, you're f***ing up. That was a tough series for me to stick up for your boy. Uh, because of the turnovers, the missed free throws, and of losing, losing to the guy that I've always said, I, in a big spot in a playoff game, I choose to trust Chris Paul more than I do Westbrook, and when that guy loses to the other guy, you look like a moron in your radio show. Chris Paul will be one of the forgotten players of like this generation. Really one of the greatest uh, point guards that's ever played, but just always gets tired and hurt at the end of a season, and, and wasted a lot of his career with teams that just didn't have the juice. The problem with 2014 playoffs, Chris Paul, is that was one of the years that he choked in the playoffs. So I did some research and every year Chris Paul chokes in the playoffs. So it wasn't just that year, it's all the years, so it's fine. I can't think of a better 11th man than Klay Thompson. Phenomenal shooter, he'll do all the dirty work, he'll guard the other team's best player, he'll have the best weed in the locker room, whatever. he'll know where all the weed spots are, it'll be great. The most popular teammate, uh, not only the Warriors, but it really seems like in the league. It just seems like everybody loves Klay Thompson. I love Klay Thompson. I don't even know why. I just instinctively like him. Yeah. See, Bill's building real functional teams. And if you build a real functional team, you have to have guys like Klay Thompson. That's a good one. 2016 Klay changed the history of the NBA from that point forward because that was the year that they beat Golden State. Or that was the year that they beat Oklahoma City in the playoffs. They were losing in game six, and Clay saved them. He went into, you know, hyper Clay mode and hit a bunch of threes. They ended up winning the game, and then they won in game seven. But if they lose that game and Oklahoma, goes to, Oklahoma City goes to the finals, Kevin Durant never goes to Golden State. It was a transcendent performance from my favorite player. I'll never forget it, and he will be remembered in the history books for all of time. Klay Thompson closing out the 2016 Thunder, that's all-time stuff. And I always have this theory about quarterbacks where if you suck at one o'clock and there's seven games, then no one's gonna care. And if you're great, people may not care. But if you're special on Monday night or Sunday night or even Thursday night now, it's different. And I really wish in a way that those Clay games were in the NBA Finals because I think it'd be all-time stuff, like books being written about it. Clay's value to the wine bottle team is his same value to the Warriors. He doesn't need the ball. You see a lot of guys on here, LeBron, Kobe, even Duncan, 
they kind of need the rock and they need a little bit of time with it. Clay can come off screens. Clay doesn't need the ball to feel involved in a game. And also, no joke, Clay can play really, really good defense. He might be the next best defender on this team next to Kawhi and Garnett. I also like that he gives me some flexibility if Kobe flakes and I actually have to move in in the starting lineup. Clay Thompson, the great, the best stoner on this team. Um, and is great because like you just literally are like, Clay, just shoot when you get the ball. You're not gonna get the ball that much, but when you get it, you can shoot. And he'd be like, okay. He's like that one bottle of wine that you don't really want to drink because like it has so much value. You're not even sure it'll be good. You'll be first of all burning it as soon as you open it. And then maybe it's not even as great as you'd hoped, but he's just completely singular. And like he sits on the shelf, He'll, he's important to have for breath and for depth of knowledge. You can't go, you can't go forward in the 21st century without 2016 Clay Thompson. He's extremely important. It's conceivable that the best possible wine bottle team that we can put out, the best five guys that fit together in the perfect way are Curry and Clay Thompson, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, and Tim Duncan. I put those five guys out together. I have shooting, I have playmaking, I can get two points anytime I want with Durant or with, uh, with Curry or with Duncan or with LeBron. Um, I have Clay in the corner, you can't leave him. I have Curry over here, you can't leave him. I got LeBron running a little two-man game with Durant. Like That's the best possible basketball team. It wouldn't make the Kobe fans happy, but I'm not here to make you happy. So that's probably my crunch time team, I'm sorry. Last but not least, you're wondering where Shaquille O'Neal was. Frankly, I was too. I, he's one of the most unstoppable basketball players I've ever seen in my life. He won three straight finals, MVPs. It makes me mad when People say he couldn't have played now because it's too fast and too small for him. Actually, he would destroy some of the lineups that are out there now. I think it would be a mismatch. And if you guarded him with Draymond Green, we would have to send Draymond to the hospital. The problem is the future of mankind is at stake and he can't shoot free throws and he's a little slow defensively and he doesn't get along with Kobe Bryant, who I felt guilt tripped into putting on this team. I don't get this. <laughs> I mean, like, like, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't get this. The thing about 2001 Shaq is he really uh, didn't play hard at all for the entire regular season and then became like a demon in the playoffs. Yeah, I hate 2001 Shaq, but he, that's, he was unbelievable. Shaq had ups, Shaq had downs. But at that point, it was a joke trying to defend Shaquille O'Neal, okay? It was a joke. You realize Devin George had a career? Like, it, it, I'm saying, like, it, it was a... It, shout out to Devin George. I'm not trying to be negative. Yeah, this is basically the apocalypse from X-Men. I almost don't even know what to say because, like, watching Shaq in the late 90s and early 2000s wasn't really basketball. It was just somebody had a cheat code and brought in this Tyrannosaurus that... Uh, you just saw guys like, flying off of him. It was ridiculous. I love him on this team. I love him uh, here because he's unlike anybody else. You know, just a physical freak who dunked on people with savage force. It's not really a thing that happens anymore. Dis doesn't shoot threes. Is he the only guy on this list that doesn't shoot threes? Give me those numbers again. 29 points per game, just under 13 rebounds, uh, 3.7 assists, and 2.8. You out your f***ing mind, Bill. Like, do you, do you hear that? That's, that's 2K numbers. I have Shaq as our 12th man, and here's what that means. We, we just, we tell him, eat whatever you want. You don't have to be in shape. Show up for the games. That's it. You can eat. You can eat on the bench during the games. But there's going to be a couple times during this whole run against the aliens where they're going to play a, a small lineup and we're going to bring you in and you're going to score 15 points in four minutes and you're going to completely destroy them and make them have to put in bigger guys. And then we'll take you out and you can have another, you know, barbecue sandwich, whatever you want. Do your thing but I need you, he's almost like I'm putting him in a fire extinguisher case and I'm breaking him if we need this overpowering force that can just take over for five minutes in the second quarter and that's it. It just made, it was not, it wasn't fair. It truly was not. Shaq was a guy that you're like, this is not fair. Should he even be allowed to play? Like, this is not right. Nobody could check him. Like, guys were just hanging off of him. Chris Dudley, like, he actually turned Chris Dudley, he dumped on Chris Dudley so hard he turned into a Republican. I ain't coming out to this bitch no more if y'all keep up this anti-Laker shit, man. This will be my last time in this motherfucker. Bill, like, I love Tim Duncan. 
I, I, I told you before, he's, you can't, man. Tim Duncan was getting messed over by Shaq at this point, man. You got to have Shaq on that starting five, man. Shout out to the Diesel. Why is he on the bench? Why is he the 12th man on the bench? That's awful. Take Kobe off, put Shaq in there. If you've got 2001 Shaq and 2001 three Tim Duncan, you could put anybody else on the team. You could put me, Jason, and Corey on there, and we're getting to the finals that season. Also, like the fact that he's coming off the bench is hilarious because, like, obviously this is a theoretical exercise, but I think, like, even in theory, my theoretical Shaq that I'm thinking of right now is really pissed about this. Like, he's angry, and I think it would be a problem. The fact that Kobe, in particular, is starting and Shaq is like coming off the bench, I think, would really gall theoretical wine Shaq. He was so larger than life. I mean, there's been no one like him since, and I don't think anyone will be like him. He's like a just completely bizarre rare specimen. There are some names that I'm not hearing on these lists. How do we not have Steve Nash on this list? Like one of the best point guards ever. Yeah, take Kobe off, put Steve Nash on. It hurts my feelings to leave Steve Nash off. I didn't feel good about it, but it's his fault for not being born in America. Nash, obviously a, a huge liability on defense. I want 05 or 06 Steve Nash instead of this 2014 Chris Ball. Steve Nash, not a choker. Also, he like started the revolution of like vegan clean eating of NBA players, and I think he should get more credit for that. So if Kobe flakes or if he doesn't like that he didn't participate in the team or he's asking questions about how involved am I gonna be in the offense, is the offense gonna run around me, all that stuff, and we just decide we have to send him home. I am going to replace him with 2009 Dwayne Wade. Actually, I would probably have Dwayne Wade in this lineup over either Ray Allen or Klay Thompson. Uh, 06 Dwayne Wade is a really good one when they won their championship with uh, Shaq. He was really good then. I, I think I think Kobe's unassailable to me and it's not a debate, but Dwayne Wade is one of the best players of all time. He's really good. 2006 Dwayne Wade, the, literally the like most statistically dominant finals performance ever, greater than anything Michael Jordan ever did in a finals. Yeah, take Kobe off, put Dwayne Wade off. LeBron, Durant, Duncan Curry, all really good guys, but not like motherfuckers. And, you know, I look at 09 Dwayne Wade, and it's like, he's, he's a motherfucker. He's gonna MF people, he's gonna yell at refs, he's gonna carry himself like this. And we kind of need that. So if I'm not getting that from 06 Kobe, uh, Dwayne Wade, I think, is the best option. It's also why I left off T-Mac. God bless T-Mac, I think you should be in the Hall of Fame. T-Mac. Are we, what are we talking, Orlando T-Mac? Or are we talking Houston T-Mac? I guess we'd, we'd pick like early Houston T-Mac after Yao's foot split in half and then he just like took over. I think the, t the thing about T-Mac is he just doesn't work hard enough. Tough to look at too. Weird looking guy. I'm pro T-Mac. I love T-Mac. You were not alpha dog. You would not call out dudes on the court and stuff like that. We're gonna need a little badassness and I think that's what Dwayne Wade brings. I feel like it never works out well when you have only superstars. So give me somebody weird like Sean Livingston. I, will, I would like Sean Livingston on my team, on any team. Give me him and give me Bruce Bowen because 2003 Bruce Bowen specifically because I need a guy who's going to like hurt some people. Because of mission, from a sentimental point of view, I have to go with 2000-2001 Allen Iverson, his MVP season, the step over to Ron Lou season, the taking it to the Staples Center and winning game one of the finals, then clapping off the Lakers after losing game two of the finals. He was a Greek god that season. The th yeah, you have to leave him. Like, it just is an indictment of Iverson that the best, his best teams were always like guys whose name you don't, names you don't really remember, whose jobs were like, specifically to rebound and throw the ball to Allen Iverson. I don't want Iverson. I love Iverson, but I don't want him on that team. You can't guard Allen Iverson. You cannot stop Allen Iverson. Allen Iverson changed the game of basketball. Strong, fearless, competitive, love AI. But I can't think of anybody who I would take off this team. Uh, you would not find a more beloved athlete in Philadelphia until Nick Foles. It was really a truly special time to be a Philadelphia sports fan when he was there. We've got a lot of advanced analytics heroes, guys who've won chips, guys who are MVPs, but what Iverson is is a folk hero, and I think every team needs one of those. A couple of Philly people on the Ringer staff have asked why Iverson wasn't on this team. Um, 
Iverson was on a team like this. It was called the 2004 Olympic team and we lost to Argentina. I'll be cutting and pasting that into my uh, resignation letter. <laughs> Dirk Hurt. I had Dirk. I had Dirk on this list for a while. Phenomenal. There's an alternate team that's just an all chemistry team. So like we get rid of Kobe Bryant, we get rid of Chris Paul, and you just put Dirk and Nash in there with all the other guys we have, and it's just a love fest. Everybody loves each other. Um, the problem with Dirk is I just felt like Duncan and KG and Anthony Davis are just their their two way ceiling was just better. Along with Steve Nash, I mean, Dirk was just like unbelievable. I mean, he won the 11 title on his own, essentially. I mean, Tyson Chandler kind of contributed and sure Jason Kidd was calling plays, but that was all Dirk. And I mean, he was amazing. 2011 Dirk was remarkable because every time it looked like they were buried, every time it looked like they had met a more talented team, he somehow summoned them and got them over the hump. It was incredible, especially in that finals where they just seemed completely outmatched. But basically, Dallas had Dirk, and that's what mattered. No, no but 2011, Dirk, one of the all-time great playoff runs, and you don't have him on the team. But you've got Kobe Bryant from 2000 and whatever. Take Kobe off, put Dirk on. Every answer is going to be take Kobe off, put this player on, by the way. 2011, Dirk. See, I don't even think that was... The thing about that Dirk is... He got hot in the playoffs, like hot beyond anything I've actually ever seen from an offensive player where that first opening round series against the Lakers, I'm like, okay, fine, he's hot. And then it just didn't stop to the point where, I mean, that Western Finals against OKC, it was like he fouled out like 15 guys in the first like three quarters of the game because it was like, it was like a Kung Fu movie where one guy fights 45 guys. The other toughest cut for me was Giannis because he actually is an alien. So for playing the other aliens, I feel like he could talk to them and maybe understand their native language. I left off James Harden because uh, I just didn't want to see the greatest players of the 21st century relegated to just standing in spots on the court watching James Harden dribble for 20 seconds. Yeah, I'll take a James Harden. Guess what? Take Kobe off, put Dwayne Sar James Harden on there. Dwayne Harden, too. <laughs> Dwayne Harden, too. Put anybody else besides 2006 Kobe. I love him there as a party guy, as a chemistry guy. Um, but I think you do, you do have to leave him off. Also, just the way he plays now, you already have Kobe Bryant for the ISOs. You can't have two of those guys. I left, uh, I left Westbrook off the team. He needs to shoot 30 to 35 times a game to really fully succeed. And I already have 06 Kobe Bryant. I did think about a backcourt of him and 06 Kobe Bryant together, and then the world just implodes and we all get blown up and we'd have a whole backcourt to, why, why did Simmons do that? Why did he put those two together? Mm, that's tough. Russ is a guy who like I want to cheer for and I want to root for and I want to say he's great, but every opportunity I have to include him on a thing that I'm doing, I'm like, mm, I don't think I want that. I don't think I want him on the Spurs. You know, I don't think I want him on this team. But sure, take off Kobe, put Russ on there. If Shaq says no, I have my alternate plan is just to throw away the 12th man spot and just have like a handshake slash chemistry guy. And But it also has to be somebody that if it's quintuple overtime, they're actually like relatively competent as basketball players. So what I came up with was 2008 Eddie House. Eddie, where did, what is this? Does Bill know something about Eddie House that literally no one else in the, in the, at the ringer knows? Has he hung out with Eddie House? Is, and is, is, is that like a known thing on the street that Eddie House is like a great hang? I'd probably go Mike Miller because people just like, Mike Miller got like three or four jobs simply because it's like, man, I love hanging out with Mike Miller. <laughs> if I had to have an irrational confidence guy in this team, it's weird because you don't think of Oban as an irrational confidence guy, but I'd probably put Manu on the team at this point, probably pick some high percentage Manu year that um, I just know he could come in and immediately think he's the best guy in the court and try to score 12 points in two minutes and get to the line. Does a lot of what Harden potentially could do. Of the 21st century irrational confidence guys, yeah, I like Manu because he was so unpredictable. You just, he's his, you just didn't know what he was gonna do. He moved in a way that was really confusing um, because he almost seemed like out of control, but he wasn't. Also like a bald guy. We don't have a bald guy. You need a bald guy. And I think Manu is like a great bald guy. At Rational Confidence, we need to look out to the sea to Waiters Island. Nothing will ever match the clapping hands of that guy in the corner of the Oklahoma City Thunder. I think Dion, Dion's had some experience with some of these guys. Uh, I think Dion would be an incredible addition.
Jason. Who would be the most radical coach we could have besides Larry Brown? Uh, Diddy. Let's just have like Jeremy Renner coach them. <laughs> <laughs> I keep, with Popovich, I keep coming back to him taking out Duncan in Game 6 of the 2013 Finals, putting in Fat Boris Dio. I, I've just never gotten over that. I know he's won five titles. I just can't get past it. It was one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. I've, I've heard it defended. I've heard it legislated. I've heard Spurs people have made the cases to me. But Tim Duncan is one of the seven best players of all time, and you didn't have him on the court during the two positions where you just needed one rebound. I can't get past it. So naturally I have to go to the president, Brad Stevens. I think he would be the coach. We'll allow Popovich as an assistant coach, but I need somebody to overrule him when he's like, we should take Tim Duncan out here and put in whoever Boris Dio is on this team. Greg Popovich is the assistant. Bill, what are you doing? What is this thing? Let's take the guy who's not done anything yet. Let's take the guy who almost made it to the finals and have the guy who's been to six finals and won five of them as the assistant. It doesn't make any sense. Let me be in charge of the ringer, I guess, and, and Bill, you can be my assistant. My coach for this team, I think the only person that could actually coach this team is, is Barack Obama. Because that's not, he's not a coach, Barack Obama. I, don't know I guess he was America's coach. What's he doing? He's like just hanging out right now. If, if you offered this team to Barack, you're like, listen, Barack, we need a coach and we think you're the only guy. I think he says yes. I'm gonna pick Phil Jackson. This team wouldn't be about wouldn't be about X's and O's to me. The team would be about managing personalities, and that was what Phil Jackson was so special at doing. With the number one pick in the wine bottle draft, my coach is Eric Spolstra. He knows how to manage these personalities. He'll defer to LeBron. I think he can defer to anyone else if he needs to, and he's a great tactician. He's my guy. So, but, but who, who would you pick as a coach? Uh, I would pick 2006 Kobe Bryant. That's who I would pick. <laughs> <laughs> That's who I want to coach.